and so they had to decide what to do as far as the, uh, the feeding tube for now, and they, she suggests to go down the nose because the, the patient has to work a little bit harder for the food instead of going to the stomach. Then the neurologist comes in and paints the dark, bleak, black picture that uh, there's no brain injury, no brain activity, really low. Well, da, da, da. So, you know, he has a tough decision to make, and, and I'm talking to him, and I'm just, you know, trying to encourage him and um, say, look, Have faith. I talked to him a little bit, a little bit about faith. He's uh, been a longtime friend, kind of on the outskirts. Um, I haven't heard a full-blown confession from him, but I'm not Jesus, so uh, that doesn't matter. But um, you know, we live our lives, and he knows, and he sees my flaws, but he also sees that I love Jesus. And uh, um, it was a good conversation, and that was. Uh, Friday, then Saturday, I was talking to him on the phone, and he was in the, the room with his mom, and uh, he said, hey, hang on a second, and he says, mom, stop that, mom, you got to stop that, and he gets back on the phone, I'm like, stop what, and he's like, well, she's picking at where the, the feeding tube's at, and I said, well, that's awesome, she knows it's there, right, right. well, yeah, yeah, I guess you're right, yeah, right, thank you, Jesus, you know, so, yeah. Uh, but it went from, you know, I'm, the, the picture that was painted is, you know, just laying there and not, you know, not responding or anything. Well, she knows it's there. So, but again, I haven't talked to him. But I proclaim by faith that, um, you know, she's healed. Yeah. And, um, you know, just continue to pray for her and uh, for Doug as well, for the whole family. There's a lot of healing that needs to take place. His sister has been around for 10 years. And, you know, when she gets the news, then, you know, they show up and, but he has a good heart about it, and we talked about that, and I said, hey, you know, maybe it's a, a good time for healing there, too. He goes, you know what, you're right. So um, just keep praying for him. I appreciate it. And uh, to know that it's done in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise God. He is good. Anybody else? Prayer request or testimony? Yeah, right. son. He's at another basketball or football camp, uh, but uh, he's here. He's home. It's just in St. Um He's going into his senior year, so um, just continue to pray for him, that edge, and uh, just wisdom in Jesus' name. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Uh, I, I, sure. I wish she would have looked it up. That's okay. I'll lift her up. I've uh, been fighting some respiratory stuff the last few weeks, but just Still weary and stuff, and she needs to get her, her strengths back. Thank you. Know, she's getting frustrated right now, uh, not having the energy to get things done that she knows that she's called to do. And, and just pray for her full healing and Amen. Him and soul in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Yes. Uh, Mary Kate, that orderly lady, she called us about nine o'clock. She lost her husband. I think I said this. Fifty-eight years. Of you know, it's a long time to be married, and she just crying and heartbroken, lonely, just, just, you know, just, she says nighttime's the hardest because they would talk, he was at the nursing home where Evelyn is, but for about two hours every night they would talk, and she's just, she's just uh, really heartbroken that the Lord would comfort her and put people in her path to be able to go minister to her. Um, Diana Tarkey also is having some issues with uh, some health issues as far as a uh, rapid heartbeat, and she doesn't know if it's a thyroid thing going on, but uh, whatever it is, the Lord's in control, and you know that too, right? Touch your Lord, touch your Lord, yes. Um, you know, it's always exciting to me when I get to go to people's house <laughs> that I've never been to before. I've been to this lady's house twice, and they're very well to do. Her husband's an orthodontist. They have property, land, you know, they have the riches, the money. And uh, she's like, I don't know what it is about you, Sheila, but she says, I just find you so fascinating. Basically, all I do is talk to her about God the whole time I'm there. There's the fascination. But, you know, yeah, so, but yeah, she's, yeah, just, she's just in awe about everything, and I got to talk to her about healing, about Jane Wyckoff's, you know, uh, she just shares all the stuff with me, so I just share stories with her, you know, pastor's healing, and I asked her, did your church talk about healing or believe in healing? She's like, well, we believe the whole entire Bible, but I don't ever hear anything like what you're telling me about. <laughs> so, you know, her name is um, Susan Langwith, 
Dennis and Susan. I don't know where the Lord's taken me, but you know, nonetheless, we sparked Markle. <laughs> sparkle Markle. That's what we're supposed to do, though. That's just right. be a light and shine and not be intimidated by what they have because Amen. they don't have what we have. You That's know, right. Right. In Jesus' name, just lift them up in prayer. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Anybody else? Please, one at a time. Please, one. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, <clears throat> I, f I feel like, not like that. We need to pray very strongly for our families, but also for us as a body of Christ. Because I've been noticing lately that the devil's tried. He's throwing a lot of mundane things at us, trying to get us to get discouraged and stop doing what we're doing. And uh, I don't know. I feel like this is because he's getting restless because he can't overcome what God is unfolding for us. That's the fact. Let's all stand. Let's take a minute. Yes, sir. Yes, sir.
Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. All right, let's uh, let's worship the Lord. All right. Hallelujah. I mean, two people in the back too.
from the deception being put placed under the burdens that are not yours the Lord took them away he finished the work remember 
remember your first love. Remember your first love. Remember when you ran to the mercy seat and he held you so close. He never let you. He never let you go. He never let you go. Never let you go. His love for you has never ceased. The purest love, the purest love. Embrace it. is love, his river is is tears for you.
Thank you for healing and for delivering, Lord. Thank you for meeting every need that we brought before you tonight. Lord, thank you for the testimonies that will come as a result of what you have done, Lord, of your finished work and the faith that we placed in it, Lord. Even your faith, Lord, the faith of Jesus, hallelujah, moves mountains, hallelujah, Jesus, opens doors, yes. brings down the very glory of God hallelujah. into the lives of people that otherwise would never know you. Lord. You've chosen a body yes, you have. through which you can express yourself and reveal yourself. Yes, Lord. We thank you for the privilege of being that tabernacle, thank you, Jesus. that dwelling place on this earth. For Almighty God, hallelujah. Almighty God, hallelujah. Nothing is impossible with you. We declare the victory over every situation, circumstance, in the name of Jesus. And we give you the praise for it tonight. In the mighty and matchless name of Jesus. The name that's above every name. Hallelujah. Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Praise God. Give the Lord a hand. Thank you, Lord. Praise God. Praise God. Thank you, worship team. God bless you. Praise the Lord. Try to be brief tonight, and uh, we're just an old-fashioned Bible study. <laughs> Suzanne, will, or, uh, Sheila will be dealing with carpal tunnel, or as some like to say, carpus tunnel tomorrow. <laughs> That's for the Latin. Seize your wrists, praise the Lord. <laughs> but, praise God. God is good, amen? Amen. And uh, it's interesting, uh, Roberto's talking about, you know, how the devil kind of just nitpicks and just, you know, tries to distract. And, but that's what the enemy does. I want to talk about revival tonight and again on Sunday, but in a little bit different way than... Uh, maybe traditionally we've thought about it and uh, what God is doing in our lives personally is always preparing us for another visitation and uh, not to get ahead of myself but uh, you know every time there is a, a descension of God or every time there's a manifestation of God there is an ascension of the children of God in other words, every time he comes to us, we are raised up. We're raised up a little higher. And that's what's so powerful about testimonies. And uh, th that we don't understand a lot of times. We think we're just testifying or we're just talking about an experience or whatever. That's prophecy. That's prophetic. And that's what, you know, we need to understand this because that does bring a manifestation of God. And it also elevates us. It takes us to another plane, another level where we can function. And that, so the devil's purpose in all of this is to try to weaken us because there's always another, another battle coming. You know, we don't recognize them necessarily always as battles, but because we're not battling necessarily against people or principalities and powers, but against uh, wickedness in high places, but it's carnal. It's not carnal, I should say, but it's uh, spiritual warfare. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times, because we're, what the devil wants to do is keep us distracted and focused on the natural or the carnal so that we don't recognize the spiritual warfare that we're actually involved in. And what God is constantly doing is rearming us and prepping us or preparing us for the next battle. Mm -hmm. And if we can stay tuned into that, then, then no matter what the devil brings against us, he can't distract us. He can't get us sidetracked. You know, uh, when I was in the service overseas, they used to, there was always probes. Before there would be a major uh, frontal attack or uh, a major offensive, like uh, where I was, there was the Tet Offensive every year. But there were ma you know, many, many battles throughout the year. But the Tet Offensive was always the big thing because it was countrywide. It was everywhere. Mm -hmm. But prior to that, there were all these little kind of distractions to get you to think it's going to happen here, it's going to happen here, it's going to come this way, it's going to come that way. 
And, uh, and even in the smaller battles, it was the same way. You'd have probings here in this part of the perimeter, and then there'd be probings over here, and then maybe the attack would come from here or someplace totally unexpected. And that's what the devil does. He wants to get you focused on some maybe relational issue, some what looks like that's the problem, you know, or a financial thing or a physical thing or whatever it is, anything to make you think that's the, it, that's the big issue, that's what you need to focus on, when in fact there's a bigger battle that's taking place. And that's what God has armed you for. The little thing's not, I mean, it's not that it's insignificant, that it can't be harmful, it's just that it's not the real deal. Right. It's just the, the thing to distract you from what the real deal is. Because if you overcome the real deal, that thing will be taken care of. You understand what I'm saying? The little, what, I don't mean to minimize them because that's still serious stuff, but there's still nothing in comparison to the grand scope of what God's trying to do. Mm -hmm. So what the devil has to do is constantly keep us in a state of uh, unpreparedness, I guess you could say, or off balance. And so uh, over the next couple of services, that's what we'll talk about in different ways, but still with the same idea that this is always, with God, it's always about revival. Individually, body-wise, and worldwide. It, it, he's always focusing on revival. We don't always recognize it as revival. We see it as all kinds of other things. But revival is what God's always about. To revive, to bring back to life, to, yes. to quicken, to, to make us more alive, you know, mm -hmm. and more powerful than we have been in oh, the past, yes. right? So let's just look, beginning tonight, let's just start with Acts chapter 13. And just two scriptures here, verse 38 and 39. Some of this stuff we've, you know, we've touched on it before. And uh, obviously the scriptures, we, we, we use them over and over. That's why they're there, praise the Lord. But I think it's important that we recognize that the, what the devil's doing and what we need to be focused on. So <clears throat> here it says, Be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins. And by him all that believe are justified from all things, from which ye could not be justified by the law of Moses. Mm -hmm. That's a huge statement right there just in itself. That by him, everybody that believes, are justified from, look at that, all things, everything, from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. Right. That's everything. That's every, what we would call failure, or the devil likes to remind us of as being failure, or uh, lack, or whatever it might be. I, I was just, I, I don't want to get into this, into the details of this, or the personalities involved, but, uh, you know, through conversations, I, I was reminded of uh, some things that other people are going through that I went through 30 years ago. And for the first probably, I don't know, 35 years of my life, it was a hell of a ride, I gotta tell you. It was, it was a nightmare at times. I mean, I'm not saying that, it was, that there weren't good times in there, but for the most part, it was just horrendous. It was, depressing and, and uh, just like no future beyond the moment. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Just, you just live there and tomorrow, you know, we'll deal with tomorrow, tomorrow, and try not to think about it and just stay. And it's, a, it's not a good way to live. No. And uh, there are a lot, of, it's amazing, there are so many people living that way yet today. And it wasn't just because it was the 60s and the 70s, you know, it, it, it just was, it's life. That's the way people are. And I, and I see it repeating itself in other people. And it breaks my heart because I know the hopelessness that they feel and what that drives you to and how much God wants them to be free, as free as I am today. I'm not saying I'm without problems, but the problems are insignificant in comparison to the way they were back then. Amen. You know what I mean? I mean, the, the weight of them is so different. The hopelessness of it and the, the sense of just being on this treadmill that just goes on and on but never really anything changes. And, and the sense of uh, hopelessness and self-defeat uh, and uh, 
you know, having to feel like you're putting on an act all the time just to get through a day, you know. Uh, it's just miserable. And when it's people, especially when it's people that you're close to, it, it just, it's horrible. Because I can still remember. I can still remember some of those feelings, you know, and what it was like and how just depressing the whole thing was, you know. And, I, you know, when you're, when you're 30, you're not thinking about when you're 60, but you are thinking about when you're 35. You know, is it going to be any better five years from now or, or, or six years from now? And, and the idea of just having to deal with this, you know, for another five years another five years and is it is this as good as it gets that kind of stuff you know and uh, I just hate to see people living that way and going through that because I have experienced it and I know I've seen both sides of it and this is so much better it's just yeah. it's just way better mm -hmm. even with even though it still has its issues because I'm still a human here you know but the devil does come to me especially when I I'm involved in those kinds of things and dealing with people like that. And when, last night was one of those nights. I was really tired. I'd, I had, had a, a spent the day with a couple of my granddaughters that I hadn't been able to spend a lot of time with this summer, and I promised them I'd do some, something with them, just me and them. So we went up to Boone, went on the train ride, and went out to eat, and just laughed and had a good time. And it was, it was really fun. So I, I felt really good, and a couple of the other grandkids were staying with us, and their parents came back and picked them up last night, and so I played around with them for a little while, they were much younger, and, uh, but it was a good day, you know, I was tired, but it was a good day, and then I get this phone call, 10 o'clock at night, yeah, thank you, Sheila, praise the Lord, <laughs> my memory, but, um, and it just, I mean, it was just a bummer, I just, I just, then I really wanted to go to sleep, you know, that's, that's my, my painkiller, hallelujah, <laughs> praise the Lord. But I really felt bad about it. Still was kind of depressed about it this morning when I got up, and I went through the routine and had the stuff I had to do and places I had to go and so forth, but it still it just was all there nagging at me. And, and part of the reason, I think, is because it reminded me so much of where I was and how I felt. And the devil loves to do that. Yes. Now, I believe God's going to deliver this other situation and the people involved in it, I really do. Because, I mean, he did it for me. Yeah. And in all honesty, that was, that was quite a job even for God. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, you know, a lot of Christians say that, you know, we're guilty, but Jesus paid the penalty. And that's kind of the way the devil likes us to look at it. Yeah, you're guilty, but Jesus paid for your guilt. Right, mm -hmm. and that's that's not exactly true. It's not precise in the way that the the gospel is presented, right. because before we put faith in Christ, we were declared guilty. Right. We were guilty from the womb, you know, from the time we were born. But after we put our faith in Christ, not when we got it all together and figured it all out, because none of us are there yet. Paul said even towards the end of his ministry, I, I, it's not as though I have arrived. You know, or that I got it all figured out. But I'm pressing toward the mark. I'm moving in the, at least in the right direction here. Right. So for the high calling of God in Christ Jesus and so forth. So once we put our faith in Christ, we are no longer considered guilty at all. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Now we still have a memory. Right. And that's what the devil uses even if it was only 10 minutes ago or 10 years ago or 30 years ago, people hurt, you know, lives affected, not just mine, people that I was involved with and everything else, you know, that, all that stuff comes back to me. You know, I still think about it from time to time and I don't like it and wish you could do undo all of that, but it's, you know, it's history. But the devil wants you to dwell on that and focus on that because it's depressing. And it, and it causes you to be dysfunctional now, in the moment. And now, I'm not, that's not me. You know, I heard somebody say this today, and this, this is not about the situation I'm dealing with right now that I'm talking about, but for all of us, think about this. 
you, you know, what the devil would like us to believe is that, because none of us have been perfect. Perfect parents, perfect brothers, perfect sisters, perfect children, perfect friends, perfect employees, you know, any of that stuff. We try to do what we do, but let's face it, it just doesn't work out that way. But when you're, for example, if you're kids, and again, this isn't about what I'm talking about here, except that just in general terms, I heard this said today, and it just made so much sense, because it sounds so much like the devil. You know, your kids get to acting up, they get to being stupid and they reject you and, well, you're not perfect and, you know, you, you, you know, you had your life was messed up too, you know, and all that kind of stuff. And so it's like the enemy wants you to feel like it's your fault that they're not perfect, that they're not doing everything exactly the way they should do it. But here's what the, the individual said today that really impressed me and he said, but here's what you have to say and that is that, look, you're right, I'm a human being. I, I've, I've messed up. I haven't always done everything exactly right. Haven't been perfect. But there came a time in my life when I believed in Jesus. And that changed everything. Yes. And now as far as God is concerned, I'm perfect. Mom. And even though I wasn't perfect for you, you have the same opportunity right. to change your life mm -hmm. as I had to change mine. Yes. At some point, you have to take responsibility for that. Yes. I had to make a decision. And you had the same opportunities, the same choices to do that very same thing. Amen. So don't, you know, like blame me forever when you're, getting, you're being given the same opportunity that I was given. That changed me. The same thing can change you. Now that's, that's encouraging for both sides of the equation, to be honest with you. And so that's, that's just part of it. We've we got to realize that today, you and I, as believers, are guilty of nothing absolutely nothing amen. amen now let's look at a couple of scriptures here isaiah 43 and verse 25 because god wants us to have revival and we're not going to have revival collectively unless we somehow have revival personally amen. i can't bring something to a group if i don't have it right. i become a burden you know and so that's what the enemy wants if he can keep us, you know, never in together, you know what, I, what I'm saying, never always on the same page. Mm -hmm. If always some of us are here and some of us are there and some of us are up and some of us are down, you know what I mean? It's hard to get a corporate sense of what God's wanting to do. Exactly. Amen? But that's what he wants. He wants us all, he wants me to have revival. He wants Roberto to have revival. He wants Suzanne to have revival. He wants John. He wants, you know, Everybody, except Mark probably, to have revival. <laughs> Praise the Lord. He's in revival. Hallelujah. We already heard him. But you know what I'm saying. You know how it works that way and it's that way. It happens that way in families too. You know, you're feeling really good. And woo, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. God's really working. And then that demon that you live with. <laughs> Uh, you know, it's just like carnal is dirt. They, they're just not with it, you know. And, uh, and then about the time they really, you know, then it's just they're casting out devils and speaking in other tongues. And you're thinking, you reprobate. I just, I, I, I'm not interested in this. And, you know, you know what I mean? It's just like that seems like that's what the enemy tries to do. Constantly keep us, you know, on a, on a different level with one another. And I'm, that's not just, I'm not just talking about husbands and wives, but fathers and sons, mothers and daughters, brothers and sisters, in the Lord as well as in our, you know, blood families. And it just, it keeps us from ever really enjoying and experiencing the totality of what God wants us to do and have. Amen. And so that's what the devil's always doing. If, if you're strong, he's going to go for the weak one. Right. You know, when you're prayed up, so to speak, when you're walking in the spirit, when you're focusing on the word of God, when you're seeing manifestations and you're experiencing and your, your expectation levels are much higher, it seems like the other one's always going through something else. You know, I was telling my granddaughters yesterday, we were just driving, they were, and they get off into some of the weirdest stuff. Uh -huh. One's like uh, 12 and the other one's almost 13, and the other one's uh, fourth grade, like nine or something, uh, eight, I guess. And, uh, 
and you know, sometimes their conversations, I'm thinking, I'm talking to like 30 year olds, but, but it's comical. And they were talking about people being depressed and you know, one of them was talking about a girlfriend that had been a cutter, you know, had cut herself and stuff and how she just thought it was crazy and, and uh, you know, what's to be you know, gained by all this and everything, you know. So we were just talking and uh, just about the depression and that. And I said, well, you know, I don't know, you can't do anything about everything, but if you're depressed, don't be around depressing people. You know what I mean? It's, it's not good. If, if you're feeling down, you need to get around people that are up, you know, that are positive, that are, you don't want to perpetuate the problem. So one of the ways to deal with, with personal depression is to get around other people that are not depressed. I mean, otherwise you're entering into a suicide pact, you know, with a bunch of people that just, you know, shoot me, I'll shoot you, you know, because I don't want to kill myself. But, you know, so I, I'm, that's the way the enemy works, though. So it seems like when one little thing goes, then there's always a chain reaction. One jerk, and then there's like eight of them. You, you know, have you ever had a day like that? You get up, and you're on your way to work, on your way to your destination. Somebody pulls out. Immediately, you know, you're jerked off. You're aggravated. You're frustrated. And then it just seems like everybody you run into that day has got some kind of a thing going. It's like they're all just screwed up. They're all angry and frustrated. You're thinking, God, get over it. Get a life. Grow up. Get past it. Do something. Yeah. I'm not, you know, your punching bag. But it just, you know, and before the day's over, you're doing the same thing. Yeah. You're so aggravated. Now you're expecting the next person that opens their mouth to be an attack. Mm -hmm. So you get on the offense before they get a chance to say anything. And now it just, you know, that's just, it seems like that's what it happens. And that's what the devil tries to do, amen, in our lives. So Isaiah 43, 25, I, even I am he that blotteth out thy transgressions for my own sake and will not remember thy sins. This is God talking. He's the one that blots out our transgressions for his own sake. Because that's what he wants to do because he wants relationship with us. And will not remember thy sins. Amen? Micah, chapter 7, verse 19. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God is good, and God wants us to have revival. He wants us to be revived, and He wants us to be so revived that it touches the people around us. Just as it can negatively, just as depression can affect you when you're around depressing people, it's depressing. But if you get around people that are excited and that are happy and that are upbeat, Sheila was just talking about it. People don't know how to deal with it. It's, it's different. You know, and, and it's, it's God. It's, it's the, the, the idea that things can always be better. And they're looking at it like, I'm sure, I mean, I've been there too, and they've got this money, and when I was in sales, even as a kid growing up working for my dad, I used to deliver furniture and stuff on Saturdays. I worked in a gas station all week after school, and on, on Saturdays I'd, I'd deliver furniture. And, uh, you know, these people, they look at you like you're just some dork delivering furniture. They don't know who you are. You're just a clown on the van, you know. And, uh, and yet, I was 16 years old, 15 years old. I was happy. I was too dumb to, to know that I didn't have it made, you know what I'm saying? But they've got this attitude of, the, you know, well, you know. But I look at them and I think, I remember going out on Fleur Drive when houses were just being built out there. And at the time, a $150,000 house was unbelievable. I'm talking about in the early 60s. And I remember Bill Peters, a big construction company, and built a house out there for seemed like $130,000, $140,000. My dad sold him all the furniture for it. We made some money. And we delivered it. And this house was unbelievable. Three floors, and you know, the upstairs, the main floor, and the, and the basement. Every one of pristine, just looked like something out of a ladies home journal or one of these you know magazines you know decorating decorators magazine it's fantastic these people were miserable had a beautiful wife younger wife he divorced the old one once he got more money <laughs> he got a young one but man did he get a handful she was just you know mean just mean and he was frustrated and you know I thought you know with all of this how happy could I be you know, how, you know, how excited could I be with the big cars in the driveway and the garage? And they were miserable. 
How much more would it be for us today? And I know Sheila sees this kind of stuff all the time. And they're looking at you and they're thinking, yeah, she's working for a living. This gal's, you know, busting her buns, trying to just keep two ends together here. And we've got all this. And she's going around telling me how to be happy. <laughs> What's wrong with this picture? You know? And it, that's, that's what I'm saying. We ha you can do the same thing with our experience with God as they do with their depression and their sense of defeat and failure with all the crap, with all the junk, with all the glitter. And they're still miserable. I mean, you just look at the news and you get these people making millions of dollars. One relationship after another, after another, after another, always miserable, wrecking their drunk, blowing their car up, you know, running over somebody, you know, just... Find, they find him in the street, naked, drunk, you know, some big star, and you're thinking, what, is, what are they thinking? They got 40 acres they could go naked and get drunk on, and they got to go out in the middle of, you know, Hollywood Boulevard and get busted. It's just like crazy. And we're looking at it, and here we are supposed to be the stupid Midwestern dorks, you know, that don't have anything, and we're thinking, my God, what a waste, and you know, what a shame. Because we have something that they don't have. And no matter how much other stuff they get, it'll never be the same. It'll never satisfy the way we have. What we have satisfies. I'm not saying we have it all. I'm not saying we've gotten to the point where we've gotten all of our promises fulfilled. But there's a hope. There's an expectation that no matter what I'm going through today, tomorrow will be better. Amen? Why? Because I have Christ in me the hope of glory. He's not holding anything against me. Amen. This is not karma. Yeah. This is the promises of God. Thank you, Lord. Amen. He will return. He will turn again and he will have compassion on us. He will subdue our iniquities and thou will cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. Man, I'm clean. I'm, I'm accepted. I'm perfect. I mean, this is incredible. Even though I know there's imperfections and I know other people can see those imperfections, it doesn't matter. Because he's saying, I'm perfect. He's saying, I, don't, I can't find anything wrong with you. You are excellent. Man, Adam, if you really begin to believe that, it will change the, the impact that other people's opinions have. They're negative remarks, their derogatory kind of snide, sneering remarks and, and attitudes and behavior can fall off of you like water off a duck's back simply because you know your true identity. You, have, you can expect good things. You can expect God to bless you. God's going to bless me. Why? Because I deserve to be blessed. Amen. Jesus took all that I deserved and gives me everything that he deserves for being perfect he got everything I deserve for being a loser and a, and a jerk and I get everything I have everything coming to me that Jesus earned because that's how God identifies me in spite of what anybody else might think or say now that's good news and that's what this world needs but before we can give it to them we got to believe it for ourselves and that's why the enemy comes with these attacks, these constant little nagging frustrations and aggravations through loved ones, through co-workers, through life just in general. Mm -hmm. To keep you from focusing on this and focusing on this. Praise, Praise God. Colossians 1 uh, verses 21 through 23. And God wants this so settled in us that we can be in perpetual revival. That, I believe, is the will of God for the last days. Yes. And these are the last days. Yes. If they aren't, they should be. Right. If, if it, he wasn't planning on them to be, they can be. Because we can make them that way. We can make them days of heaven on earth if we will believe what he says about us. If we will live the way he has declared us to be. And you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled. That's my life. That's my bio right there. That could be on my tombstone if I ever die. You that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh 
through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in His sight. Yes. Now, if you don't believe that, you're got, you've got to be saying that you believe your ability to fail is greater than His ability to overcome it. You're making your... That's idolatry. You're making yourself greater than God. It's insane. If you continue in the faith, grounded and settled, that's what I'm talking about here tonight. And be not moved away from the hope of the gospel. That's what the devil's trying to do. He's trying to move you away from the hope of what Christ has done for you. The hope, the expectation of good, of blessing, of breakthrough, of relationships restored, of finances overflowing, amen, of doors open, of just endless opportunity for the good life, praise the Lord, the best life which ye have heard, and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister. Praise the Lord. So it's obvious, just from these few scriptures, that God doesn't want our past to be held against us in any way, shape, or form. We are free from accusations. Amen? Colossians chapter 2, verses 13 through 15. And you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, that's past tense, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against you, that's the law, and everything that you failed at, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Amen? So God has re erased our sin. All of our failures have been blotted out. It's all off of the history books of heaven. None of it's there anymore. Our history is made new. We have a new history. Amen? Our history is made new. Our record is completely wiped clean. And you know that Satan is the accuser of the brethren. Mm -hmm. But here, God has completely expunged our record. Amen? Yes, All of our sins are wiped out of the record book. Past, present, and future. Because it's all past to God. It's all future. It's all now. Mm -hmm. Praise the Lord. So God makes a mockery. That's what he's saying in those scriptures we just read. God makes a mockery of those evil principalities of Satan himself... Every time he comes, amen, to prosecute us or to accuse us, God mocks him. God makes a mockery of it. Amen? Galatians chapter 1, verses 6 and 7. And that's what we ought to be doing. We ought to be doing the na 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 Whenever the devil comes with this accusation, sorry, you can't touch me. My dad's bigger than your dad. Praise the Lord, you know. I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you. That's these principalities, that's these spirits. They manifest in human beings, and that's where the troubling comes from. Amen. And would pervert the gospel of Christ. Mm -hmm. Amen. So Paul was frustrated. And he was frustrated with these Galatians Amen. They, because they had abandoned the freedom that, they, that God had given them through Christ. Now that, you're talking about a big percentage of the church. Amen. And even each one of us individually at different moments in a day, we do the same thing. We start believing another gospel. That is not another gospel because there's only one gospel. Right. But in the believing of that lie or that accusation or that remark or that attitude, we burden ourselves again with stuff that we've been delivered from. We act as though we are what somebody else has de ex described us to be or what our own intellect sometimes tells us, and we give up the freedom. Amen? The free it's freedom that makes you happy. Hallelujah. It's freedom that gives you joy. It's freedom that gives you an expectation of good. It's freedom that makes you think that all is going to work out fine. Mm -hmm. 
It's the burden that just starts to depress and to weigh you down and to make you think, I don't know if God's ever going to do anything about this. You know, I mean, after all, so-and-so is right. I did really say that or feel that or act that or, you know. It's, it's a lie. It's an accusation from someone who God mocks. And Paul makes it clear that being bound by an obligation to do the right thing or the perfect thing is not a gospel. That's not a gospel. That's not good news. Amen. It's not good news for any of us. Praise the Lord. Okay, Romans chapter 4 Verses 24 through chapter 5, verse 1. It's uh, only about two or three scriptures here. 424 through 5, 1. Get the Ben Gay out there for, <laughs> for Sheila and lay hands on her. Praise God. Verses uh, 4, 24 through 5, 1. But for us also to whom it shall be imputed, if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. Praise the Lord. Keep going to 5, 1. Therefore. Everybody say, therefore. therefore. Because of that. Therefore. Being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Galatians chapter 2, verse 16. Lots of scripture. I said it was Bible study. <laughs> Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Amen. Galatians 3, verse 24. Wherefore, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ that we might be justified by faith. Yes. Praise the Lord. 2 Peter 1, verses 1 and 2. I know this sounds like it's repetitious, but come on, it's by hearing the Word of God that we are transformed, that our minds are renewed, that we become everything that God has already declared us to be. Amen? We, we've got to get free, church. We've got to get loose, amen, from these lies and these accusations of the enemy if we're ever going to have the kind of revival that God intended us to have. Right. Amen. We've got to be, just begin to breathe in, amen, this gift of God, the Word of God, the breath of God that transforms us, amen, into His likeness. Amen. I, I, I don't want to leave this place and wait to get to heaven to experience all that. That's going to be great. But I don't want to miss the opportunity for the great blessings and, and promises of God to be fulfilled right here and now. I want to see people that I didn't believe could ever be saved, saved. Uh, I want to see people like me saved. Oh, Amen. I want to see people like me get free. I want to see people that I've thrown my hands up in the air and thought, this is, oh my God, just take them quick. You know? <laughs> I want to see their lives transformed. I want to see them living, amen, happy and serving God and, and happy to be living for God and influencing other people in that way. I want to see that. I want to see it for them, but I want to see it selfishly for myself. Come on. Praise the Lord. Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of our and of Jesus our Lord. Praise the Lord. Yes. So justification is received by belief, yes. not by behavior. Right. Amen. Which brings us to know and love God more. Yes. Amen. I, I got to tell you, I, I don't have a perfect love for God. I don't have a perfect love for anybody because I'm imperfect. But my love for God is way different than it was when I was saved, first saved. There you go. 
Because it was a love, hate, uh, you know, a love, fear kind of thing. I love you. <laughs> I really do. Wait, everything okay? You know, I love you. Because I'm afraid if I don't love you, this could get ugly in a hurry. Praise the Lord. You know? But I don't have that sense of, uh, of fear. I'm free to just love him with my inadequacies. With my limited ability to love. With my dysfunctional love. I can love him and just know that it's accepted and he, and he loves me anyhow. Hallelujah. He loves me perfectly. Yes. Amen. And the more I realize this, the more I understand it, the more I can love him. The more, the more I love him, the less threatened I feel by him, the more I feel I have access to him. Yes. And the more I feel I have access to him, the more I sense that good things are going to happen. Because in his presence, right? If he wants me in his presence, that means he wants to do stuff for me. Amen. He wants to spend the day with me, just like I want to spend the day with my granddaughters. He wants to just do stuff with me because I'm fun to be around. I'm a, I'm a pretty cool guy, you know. I'm a wild and crazy guy, uh, you know. I mean, but the Lord wants to be with me. Hallelujah. Yeah. yeah but... <laughs> Praise the Lord. <laughs> no, I mean, yeah, he wants to get high with me. Right. Not the way I used to get high, but he wants me to get high with him. Amen. He wants me to be high and lifted up with him. Praise the Lord. He wants me to enjoy, amen, the indicative quality of God. That the more you're with him, the more you want to be with him. The more you have of him, the more you want of him. Amen. And, and it's like little things lead to big things. It's like they're always talking about drugs. You know, oh, well, marijuana is no big deal, except that it leads to bigger drugs. Well, Jesus is no big deal. Ah, but he leads you to a bigger and a fuller understanding, a greater knowledge of God, a greater awareness of his love. Right. He'll lead you to where you just can't get enough. Right. Where you've got to have your God fix. You go. Where you've got to have your Jesus thing. You're jonesing for Jesus, you know. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Amen. I know I'm being kind of crude here. But come on. I mean, that's God wants us to want him. Yeah. And he says the way that works, it really works by you knowing that I've already justified you. Yes. So that nobody else can come and de-justify you or take away from you what I have declared you to be. Uh, Amen. Amen. Praise God. So the accuser of the brethren has so many Christians... He's got their minds monopolized right. by guilt and by shame. Because we do screw up. I do shameful things from time to time. I mean, I, I am guilty of doing things that I shouldn't do. You know, saying things that I shouldn't say. Behaving in ways that I shouldn't. You know, with other people. You know, I'm not, I'm not talking about, you know, robbing banks and murdering and raping but look it's all it's all the same mm -hmm. it's all missing the mark it's all it's all anything like that can make you feel guilty right. can make you ashamed right. right well people have a tendency to take advantage of that oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah and they do it by the accuser of the brethren or the accuser of the brethren uses them Amen. The carnal mind mm -hmm. to bring you into guilt. Right. The negative side of that is it also brings them into the same thing. Right. Because if they feel that way about you, they've got to feel that way about themselves. They've got to realize this is a two-edged sword here. Mm -hmm. You know, It cuts both ways. You're going to judge somebody else. You're going to get judged. You're going to be judging yourself. Amen. In the same way. Praise the Lord. Mm -hmm. So guilt and shame is like cancer. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it's it's what destroys our souls, you know, our, our, the way that we think, the way that we feel about ourselves, our, our, our personalities and so forth. And that's what it does. It shatters our confidence to be, my confidence to be lovingly accepted by God. You understand what I'm saying? When, when I'm in guilt and shame, it ruins my sense of God's acceptance. I mean, maybe he'll put up with me, but he really doesn't love me. He really doesn't want to be with me. He's just kind of tolerating this loser, you know, this, this failure. Amen? But he wants me to be totally understanding of his loving acceptance and allow him to embrace me. 
as God, as my Father. I mean, come, that's what he wants. That's hard. I mean, that's hard. Even standing here talking about it, it's, you've got to almost overcome a mental thing to even say it with any kind of sense of, of truth to it. Because it doesn't make sense in the natural. But that's everything that God's done. That's what I talked about, I think it was Sunday. He, the sin was, is not the issue. Sin is a side thing. Sin, he wants me. He wants to love me. He wants to embrace me. He wants to have this intimacy with me. And sin was just in the way. It's me that it was all about. But that is something that had to be dealt with. And, and nothing's changed. So the devil keeps trying to drag up something that I never had any control over in all reality to begin with. To keep me from being able to experience this love and this embrace and this confidence in God's goodness toward me. Amen? Instead of having your mind preoccupied with your failures, you've got to choose to believe that your record of failure is gone. Even the failure tomorrow is gone. Praise the Lord. We've got to celebrate the fact that God has pronounced in front of all of heaven and all dominions and all principalities that you are in right standing with him. Amen. The devil knows it. He's just hoping you don't. God, I mean, think about it. God declared this. Suzanne is righteous. That's my daughter. That's my lover. That's my bride. I love her. She's perfect. He told it to all the angels. He told it to all of the saints that were already there. He told it to all of the demons in the air and the principalities and powers in heavenly places. Amen. And then he told it to everybody in hell. Everybody knows except Suzanne. You know, I mean, you ever the last one to find out. <laughs> exactly. Amen. Take a message. Yeah, you see what I'm saying? God has declared this, and whatever comes out of God's mouth is true, even if it wasn't true before he said it. Once it's spoken, it's a reality. Amen? In most churches today, the finished works of Jesus, which are like the truths of, of reconciliation, of remission of sins, redemption, most of them are misrepresented. I'm not saying they're not talked about, they're just misrepresented in the way that they are talked about. Amen? So most of us, if we had any kind of religious background at all in the past, before coming to Christ, we had misconceptions. We had misteachings, wrong teachings, and then after coming to Christ, most of us have had some wrong teaching along the way too. I've taught wrong. Amen. But our justification is ignored almost entirely. So remission of sins, uh, you know, uh, acceptance from God, uh, all of these kind of things have been misrepresented, but justification is almost not talked about at all. Because once, once you know that you are justified, you don't need a teacher anymore. You need to be teaching. That's revival. That's where grace spreads. That's where God is manifested. That's where the glory of God is revealed. Amen? Praise the Lord. Justification is the crowning glory yes. of the gospel. Yes. It's like the apex, the acme, the epitome of what God's doing. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 7. Praise God. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory. Amen? Amen. See, the gospel justification is where God displays his infinite wisdom. We think about it. This is genius beyond. 
I mean, to say it's genius almost diminishes it. It's so profound. It's so beyond anything we could have thought of or dreamed up or, or planned. But it, it reveals, this, this is the mystery that reveals or displays God's perfect wisdom. Amen? Amen. Psalm 71, verses 14 through 16. This is why David, with all of the junk that went on in his life, much of it due to himself, could still praise the Lord. Could still talk about how good God is. Could still say, oh, you know, the enemies are coming against me this way and that way, and yet the Lord will defeat them. Got nothing, but I'm going to have everything. Amen. I will hope continually. Everybody say, I will hope continually. continually. And will yet praise thee more and more. Yes. Hallelujah. I don't, you know, all of us have praised him at some point. I mean, we had some stuff happen. We go, whoa, praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. I didn't expect it to happen. I didn't have it coming, but you did it. And praise God. Thank you, Lord. I've gone to bed at night. Just praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. This, this is not, I don't know how to say anything more than just thank you, God. Thank you, Lord. Amen. But yet, I will praise him more and more. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. My mouth shall show forth thy righteousness and thy salvation all the day. For I know not the numbers thereof. I will go in the strength of the Lord God. I will make mention of thy righteousness, even of thine only. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Amen, amen. What causes us to praise? What causes us to glorify God? It's the chief object of our joy. I'm justified. I'm accepted. I have every reason to hope for continuous blessing and greater blessing. Praise God. Glory to God. Amen. Isaiah 61 and verse 10. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah, Jesus. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. Yes. Amen. Listen, believe me. When you get this, nobody's got to encourage you to rejoice. What? Nobody's going to have to say, come on, rejoice in the Lord. <laughs> they won't be able to shut you up. Amen. And that's infecting. That's infectious. It's like depression. You get around depressing people and as long as you go, ah, Give me some scissors. I, I just want to poke my eyes out and gah, gouge out my ears. I don't want to hear or see any more of it. But get around somebody that has got a revelation of their justification and the presence of God, and they are rejoicing. They, they'll, get, you, they'll get so happy and excited. You'll either rejoice with them or you'll run screaming into the street to get away from them. You'll embrace it or you'll run. Hallelujah. Amen. But most of the time they come running to you. This is exactly what Sheila was talking about. And most of us have experienced it. We, when you're in that place, woo! Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. You, you know, it just it, you don't have any more reason to be rejoicing from the, the world's perspective than the man in the moon. But you can't help yourself. You know God's doing something. God's doing something good. I don't even know how good it's going to be. I just know He's doing it. He's going to give me the desires of my heart. He's going to bless me in ways. I, oh, doors are going to open. Stuff's going to happen. I can't believe how good God is and how He's blessing me. And people look at you and they think, what in the world? But it's infectious. And they want it. They want to know what makes you so happy. How? You, you're reading the same newspaper I'm reading. You're seeing the news reports I'm seeing. Amen? You, you're working in the same kind of job that I'm working at. But something about you is different. You seem to have hope. You seem to expect something good. When all indications are, you ought to be expecting something bad. People want it. My God, we know they do because we want it. We know they do because God wants us to have it. It's the goodness of God that draws men to repentance. 
Don't let the devil fool you. I know a lot of times it's bad crap that happens to people that gets them to turn to God, but it's the goodness of God that draws them. Praise God. I will regret, greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he hath clothed me with the garments of salvation. He hath covered me with the robe of righteousness, as a bridegroom decketh himself with ornaments, and as a bride adorneth herself with her jewels. Praise God. Amen. You can see him coming. You know who the bride and the groom is. Amen. Lots of people dressed up at the church. But there's no getting around who that bride is. She's dressed better than everybody else. Amen. He's got the tuxedo, the, you know, she's got the gown, the thing, and the whole deal. And you know, here they come. And they seem to be really happy. They seem to be expecting something good. <laughs> Amen. They're thinking, this could be the night. This, this looks like it's going to be a really good day. Amen. And, and not only that, but when the day's over, it's just going to get better. Hallelujah. That's how we're supposed to be. Amen. Dress like the bride, knowing, woo, look out, honey, something great is going to happen tonight. <laughs> Amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. As the bridegroom decketh himself with ornaments, and his bride adorneth herself with jewels. Hallelujah. Forgive my carnality here, but we got to see it to believe it. Praise the Lord. So once we have believed, amen, we are considered blameless and righteous. Blameless and righteous, whether we sin a little or whether we sin a lot. I mean, this is huge. It's, but it's the truth. Amen. Colossians 1, 12 and 13. And we'll wrap up with one more scripture after this. Praise the Lord. Colossians chapter 1, 12 through 13. You've got to feed yourself on this. You've got to keep this always uppermost in your mind. You've got to be thinking this way all the time because the devil does not take a day off. Right. Right. He's constantly trying to throw something out there to get you to bite on it. Come on. Amen. And sometimes he's got that thing set on drag, on light drag, and you're just running with the bait. You think, I'm, I got away with it. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm, it's okay, I made it. And then all of a sudden, he sets the hook. And you just like, what, what, what happened? Yep. You know, what's going on? <laughs> he got you. Because you weren't focused. You weren't believing what God had said. Hallelujah. Giving thanks unto the Father which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. He made us acceptable for the, accept, for the, for the inheritance. Mm -hmm. Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. Already we're there. We're seated with him in heavenly places. Yep. Amen. Mm -hmm. Don't settle for, a, you know, a worm. Right. You know what I mean? Don't, don't settle for the stink bait. Right. When you can have it all. It, is. it all belongs to you. Mm -hmm. Amen. Since justification is complete, and we know that from every scripture that we looked at tonight, because justification is complete, then there are no degrees of justification. You're either a believer and justified, or you're not. You're not just because you're a little bit of a believer, a little bit justified. You're completely justified. The problem is, you just believe a little bit of that justification. And that's what makes the difference. And, and once we really believe in the gospel, amen, church, that is revival. That is revival. It'll revive you and it'll infect everybody that you come into contact with. They'll want to know what you're feeling and why you're feeling it. Where did you get this? How do you, why, why, do you, why do you seem to be blessed all the time? Why is it you're getting the blessing? Why, you know, we're seeing it. I've heard Suzanne talk about it. I've heard everybody here talk about it to some degree. Rob, you know, blessings, you know, financial opportunities, a job. You know, it, we're, we're seeing it, but we're not seeing it in totality the way we should. We should expect those to be the norm. We should expect that to be constant and, and continuous and always that way. Favor from everybody, not from, just from God, 
But God's favor translates into favor from everybody. Even your enemies will reach out and bless you. Amen? That makes them not my enemy anymore. That makes them a blessing. Praise the Lord. So that's the definition of revival. We, we've given revival all sorts of names and, and described it in all sorts of ways. But the truth is, everything flows from the gospel. The true gospel. Amen? Our justification, our acceptance by God, our sense of expectation and hope in God, that is revival. That, that causes people to hunger. Because then you can expect healing. You can expect financial breakthrough. You can expect, uh, you know, just uh, unexpected blessing. You can expect relationships to be restored. You can expect the people that have struggled to get a job, to have a job. Not just a job, but a good job. Amen? You can expect the people that have just been eking by all of a sudden to have more than enough. So much so that they start being a blessing to somebody else. They can't handle it. They can't stop giving it. Because it just keeps coming in. Amen? Amen. That is revival. It's not... Thank you, Jesus. I'm sorry for all my sins. Forgive me. Make me holy. You know, an altar call. I don't want to belittle altar calls, but I'm just saying that that's what we've called it, but that's not revival. Revival is a good thing. Revival is an exciting thing. Revival just wants you to have more and be more excited and greater. And nobody's doing anything but God. We're just rejoicing. We're just celebrating. We're just praising God. And He cannot help himself, yes. but to keep blessing and to keep pouring it out. And people just keep coming because something's going on over there. People keep getting blessed. And I know some of them. They don't deserve to be blessed. So maybe I can sneak in the back door and get a blessing. Like the woman with the issue of blood. Sneak up here and get a miracle without him knowing it. Oh! I've been healed. I mean, come on. It can happen. It, it, it does happen. It happens in the Bible. She had an expectation. That God's goodness was greater than her fear of Him. Yes. Even though she was still afraid. Right. She saw too many miracles to not be attracted. Right. That's revival. Yes. And that's what God wants here. Hallelujah. For me personally and for every one of us so that He can then revive those that are outside. Amen? Yes. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Yes. Praise God. So expect good things. You're a revival. You are a walking revival. Amen? Just expect it. And others will begin to be gravitating and drawn to you. Amen? God bless you. You're dismissed in the name of the Lord. Come back Friday night. Remember, Eastern Gate, House of Prayer. Let's just pray into the presence of God. Praise our way into the presence and just see what God's going to say to us. And prepare us for the next time we come together. Amen? God bless you. Have a great rest of the week.